So anyway, of course, like I said, I'm going to move on, uh, of course, to talk about ancient Greece uh, today, continue, of course, with that. Uh, now, from the previous class, I had talked about um, how um, I think we are getting into, like, uh, the rise of Sparta and Athens. And, of course, the next thing that happens, you know, in the whole Greek period, uh, ancient Greece of the Hellenic Age, of course, is the so-called Greco-Persian Wars, which they say starts the whole classical period, you know, of ancient Greece sometime in the fifth, beginning of the 5th century B.C., so you have these series of so-called Greco-Persian Wars uh, that happen. It's It's got all kinds of names that they call it. Uh, of course, some people call it the Greek-Persian Wars uh, also as well. <clears throat> they also call it the, um, you know, lost that for some reason. They call it the Greek-Persian Wars. They also call it just plainly the Persian Wars uh, as well. And... Um, I'll get to, of course, Herodotus. Well, Herodotus later, of course, is one of the main historians that writes about the wars um, overall. And I'll talk about him in a bit. But I want to first go ahead and talk about how the wars broke out uh, in the Greek world. You can see the wars lasted a while. Uh, they go from about 499 to about 449. So around 50 years that the Greeks fought the Persians. Of course, they continue later. You know, Alexander the Great later fights him too uh, when he invades into uh, the Persian Empire later in the 4th century. So these wars kind of continue over a long period of time. A lot of it had to do with the expansion of Persia. Persia began to expand from Iran into Iraq and Turkey. Uh, they began to expand eastward uh, into India, Egypt. And then, of course, what happened was they pushed into western Turkey that they entered, of course, the Greek world. I think the fall of the kingdom of uh, Lydia was one of the main uh, incidents that really led maybe to the beginning of it. And this all happened after the death of Cyrus the Great. Uh, we study about the, the, the period of King King Darius or Darius the Great, known as the, uh, Darius the First. Uh, that's the time period of really when conflicts really arose uh, between the Greek and the Persian uh, war worlds. Uh, and um, I'll get into like what sparked the war. There was, a, a, of course, a famous uh, conflict that happened that really started uh, the whole Greco-Persian Wars. And that was the, um, it was called different names. They usually call it the Ionian Revolt. It happened over like a period of like five or six years uh, between about 449 in 494, I have a map I can show you of the um, Greek world, the Persian world at the time. Uh, and uh, you can see in this map that, um, you know, Persian Empire is huge. It's like, I don't know, it was like 40, 50 times bigger than the Greek world uh, at the time. You look there where it says Ionia, that area was an area which was mostly controlled by uh, Greek city-states that had been colonized through um, mostly through the Athenians, Athens and Greece. They had sponsored a lot of these colonies, uh, and um, they didn't really want to be under uh, Persian rule. Uh, and so they revolted in 440. That's the wrong date there. I just noticed there. Little typo there, I see, but it should be 499 to 494. Uh, and um, so what happened was King Darius, Darius the Great, eventually, you know, put the revolt down, sacked uh, their, one of their major cities there, like Miletus. That caused the Athenians uh, to get really angry about, uh, you know, Miletus being sacked and all that. So what happened was Athens sent their own naval force and army to attack the Persians in Turkey. Uh, they actually marched inland and attacked one of their cities, which was called Sardis, actually burned it to the ground. Uh, and so this basically led to King Darius retaliating against the Greeks. Uh, and so it led to basically one of the first invasions. There's like two main in invasions where the Persians try to you know, conquer Persia uh, and all that. Uh, and um, so that's really what sparks the whole, 
you know, Greco-Persian wars uh, at that point. So that's basically how they, they got started, you know, tit for tat for, you know, both sides, you know, fighting each other. Here's another slide if you want to look at that. A lot of the main topics, of course, I'm talking about today. But uh, you can look at those later if you want. Uh, anyway, um, now I didn't, uh, of course, I was going to talk about also Herodotus. Herodotus, um, who I mentioned earlier, so-called father of history, which we've talked about, you know, numerous times, is the oldest source really on the Persian Wars. So he's where we get a lot of our information about all the different battles uh, associated uh, with the Persian Wars, you know, like the Battle of Marathon, Battle of Thermopylae, Battle of uh, Salamis, etc. Um, so he's the main historian. There are other historians that write later, but obviously, since this is the oldest, that's the one we have to rely on most uh, on the on these wars. His books are called different things: uh, the histories of Herodotus. They also call it the history of the Persian Wars uh, as well. He's actually writing kind of at the end of the wars, you know, right, right after they, they ended. So he's obviously using some kind of sources for it, like eyewitnesses that were in the war and other sources. But some of his sources are kind of questionable sometimes. And a lot of these, a lot of that writers like Herodotus were, were prone to exaggeration. So like he says, like Xerxes the Great later has a two million man army <laughs> that invades Greece. And likely not. But you know, just that's the kind of stuff uh, they write. But I guess they did that to also to sell books, you know, because he's you know trying to make money, you know, selling these history books uh, more than anything. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the first invasion, uh, which I told you takes place under uh, I think King. I think we talked about King Darius the Great. Of course, uh, he didn't actually. Uh, he wasn't directly involved. Uh, in the invasion, like he didn't send the actual, well, he sent the forces, but he wasn't really there uh, in the actual battles and all that. But um, the first Persian invasion happened in 490 BC, about August or September is usually when they think Darius, um, his naval force, armed forces, which may have had maybe 30,000, maybe more than that, uh, that of course came across the uh, Aegean. Paul Point was to attack Athens, get revenge for what happened to um, Sardis, and then maybe take control of Greece uh, at that point. So leads to a famous battle, which is well known in uh, Greek and European history, which is called the Battle of Marathon. It happened in September 490. They're not sure exact date on when it happened, but it is considered, by the way, to be the first major battle in European history. I wouldn't count the Trojan War because they're not sure if that really happened or not. Uh, they do know that the Greeks were outnumbered in the battle uh, heavily, at least three three to one, maybe four to one odds. Uh, the Greeks had about maybe 10,000 hoplites, which included mostly Greek forces from Athens. And then there was another city-state called Plataea uh, that also put up forces as well. And the Persians had at least 30 at least 20, 30,000, maybe more than that. They may have had, it's kind of debate about what the sources are on that. There's different numbers on it. Uh, but um, Marathon um, is um, it's located about 26 miles uh, from Athens. Uh, it's located on what is called the Plain of Marathon. It's, of course, named after the city-state. Now, of course, I'll talk about later how it's also where the name of the famous athletic athletic event comes from. You know, the 26.2 mile marathon run, of course, originates from this actual, um, you know, battle that took place. Uh, and um, there was a general at that battle. There were actually several generals on the Greek side uh, that were involved. The most important was Miltiades. Uh, he was actually this uh, general that had actually fought for the Persians originally, but he switch to the other side. Uh, there are actually Greeks fighting on both sides in the war. Same thing under Alexander later as mercenaries. Uh, but he was the guy that talked the other generals into attacking the Persian forces. Uh, I think they were kind of concerned that the Persians would bring more forces up. So he had close to 30,000 already. 
And Miltiades came up with this flanking maneuver where he attacked their left and the right flanks. I think I've got a map showing the battlefield if you want to look at it, um, which is right here. It kind of depicts a battlefield. And uh, as the um, Persian forces came up, you can see they, they enveloped them on their left and right wings. This caused the Persian forces to disintegrate uh, as a military force. And it led to basically a rout, is what happened uh, in that battle. Uh, and they fled to their ships to get back on their ships. And, and uh, I think they killed some of them as they got back on their ships. And uh, so the whole, the whole thing was a rout. You know, the, you study about the Battle of Marathon. <clears throat> they just, you know, it was really, really a lopsided battle. Uh, and um, there's different reasons why. Uh, of course, there's one was, you know, the fact that the, we already talked about all the different technology and armor that the um, Greeks possessed, like the kind of, you know, hoplite shields they used and weapons and so on. And a lot of it was just superior to what the Persians had like armor weapons wise which you see there in the greco-persian wars and then later with the wars alexander the great of course fights also the persians pretty much it's no, no match uh, overall um so that had that played definitely a rule and i don't think the persians had really ever fought much against greek phalanxes that was another problem too that, that they they didn't really have an answer for it uh, like other battles uh, that in the future as well. Rada said the casualties were pretty lopsided too. 6,400 Persians were killed or wounded or whatever. And then the Greek side was 192. I don't know how you got those numbers <laughs> exactly, but those seem like kind of like, you know, weird numbers. You know, if you look at those, like totally lopsided. I don't know if I believe that or not, but that's what he said, you know, his books. But uh, anyway, it, it caused the collapse of the first invasion. I think the what happened was the um, study about what occurred was the Persians tried to uh, send their fleet around to attack Athens uh, from the front, um, like down in the south. Uh, and the Greeks were able to get their forces back in time to defend Athens. And so after that, uh, Darius's forces went home, more or less. So the whole invasion failed. First invasion, that wasn't close compared to the, the second one. That'll be, of course, 10 years later. Uh, of course, go on, of course, into the marathon story, you know, which I want to talk about a little bit as well. Uh, there was a famous uh, runner and messenger that was associated with the battle uh, that Herodotus and also the uh, uh, Greek writer Lucian talks about. I think it was in the second century. Lucian was like a Greek writer of the Romans, he mentions the story as well. His name was either Phidippides or also called Philippides. It's kind of a debate on what the name is exactly. But supposedly, um, right before the battle, he had been sent to Sparta to get aid uh, for the Spartans to come help uh, the Greeks against the Persians. But they got there too late. I don't really do anything about it. Um and so after the battle, after they won the battle, supposedly Phidippides then ran to Athens, 26.2 miles or whatever it is. When he got there, he told them that they'd won the battle. And supposedly, I think what he said was something like Nikomen, uh, which in Greek meant we have won. Um, of course, the legend is they dropped dead of exhaustion after running that, 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 that long of a length. Now, is that a true story? Uh, they're not sure. Um, Herodotus does not mention the marathon run uh, specifically uh, and all that. Uh, Lucian does. Uh, there's a writer that's writing about two second century a AD or CE, about 1800 years ago. So it's written like way later, you know, about that story. So they're not sure if it's a true story or not. But it's where the whole marathon competition came from, which was later adopted in the 1896 uh, Athens Olympics like the first summer games that were put on in modern times. So, yeah, it might be a true story, but uh, it's an interesting story about that. But it was a great victory, though, and of course, uh, like we talked about. So that was the so-called first invasion. Total total, total failure, that first invasion um, that happened, you know, more or less. All right, so I'm going to, of course, move on next. I'm going to talk about what happened. They have, of course, the 
so-called um, uh, second invasion uh, that occurs, uh, which I want to get into next. Um, and um, so we got that one that comes next. And um, uh, that one was led by King Xerxes the Great, uh, who, of course, also called Xerxes the First. Uh, he, of course, was the son of King Darius uh, the Great. Uh, his invasion was more famous than the first one. Happens in, like I said, 480 BC, and it goes down to about 479. Uh, and uh, Xerxes, uh, this time, uh, wanted to make sure that they were more successful. So uh, what he did was he amassed whatever kind of huge army that he could build, which Herodotus, I told you, it <laughs> claimed that it was 2 million men, 2 point something million or something like that, uh, that was in this huge army, which I guess he amassed throughout his whole empire. But they think it's more like maybe a quarter of a million. I think it would be almost impossible for that large of an army to survive, you know, logistically, you know, across a huge area in Greece. It just wouldn't be impossible. They probably would have lost for sure. The Greeks it would have been two million troops. There's no way they would have been able to stop that. Uh, so it's probably a smaller army than they what they say. And two hundred fifty thousand might not even be it either. It might be much smaller than. I think it could be like maybe a hundred to hundred fifty thousand, maybe what what it might have been. Uh, Darius across. I mean, not Darius. Xerxes. Across the Hellespont, which is between basically Greece and Turkey. It's a little waterway that's kind of like south of where uh, Istanbul is today. And uh, they constructed a bridge across it, which was almost a mile long, not quite. I think it's like nine tenths of a mile. Herodotus actually tells a story about that, which is kind of almost comical. And apparently, the first bridge, which was like a, poop, a pontoon bridge uh, built with ships. They, they put ships across the uh, actual Hellespont, and they built like a bridge across it. Well, apparently the bridge collapsed on the first attempt to cross. Uh, and so uh, I guess the Persians being superstitious or whatever, they actually got men out in the water with whips, and they whipped the water to try to get the water to cooperate. <laughs> then they built the second bridge, and it worked. <laughs> and from there, they were able to cross. I don't know if I believe that story. But that's a pariah story, typical kind of story. Um, so, yeah. So, so then he was able to cross, you know. So from there, he was able to then come down through. Uh, he went through Thrace to northern Greece, Macedon, then Macedonia. Uh, and so from there, the Greeks then realized that they had to band together. And so the Greeks formed like this Greek league or Greek alliance of, of, of city states, uh, like a military alliance. Uh, and so they, they put up forces, they put up naval forces uh, to try to stop the invasion. And uh, the Greeks came up with a strategy, which was to try to block and slow down Xerxes forces, which were you know much larger than theirs. Uh, and so they tried to block Thermopylae Pass, which is uh, right kind of above Boeotia uh, in kind of central Greece. Uh, and then they also they tried to block what is called the Artemisium Strait, which is like a naval strait that's uh, kind of like um, close to the same area where Thermopylae is. So it's right right close by. And that, that would allow them to evacuate those areas that are in the south, like Athens, Thebes. Uh, those city states get them evacuated, uh, and also try to bring up in reinforcements so that they can try to be more successful militarily uh, overall. I do have a map, of course, showing you kind of the route that um, Xerxes forces and naval forces take. So yeah, Artemisium Strait is about right here, which they weren't as successful with that, trying to block it. And then of course Thermopylae Pass is right here where Delphi is, uh, Plataea, Thebes, that's what they call Boeotia, which is right here. Then Attica, remember, it's down here where Athens is. So Xerxes was going to come down here, conquer all this, of course, and I guess capture everybody, enslave people. Uh, and, um, of course, the Greeks were more successful at Thermopylae Pass, uh, which the Word Thermopylae is a word in Greek that means um, hot, hot 
gates because there was some like warm springs that are there that people would bathe in, hence the name. Uh, and um, so uh, anyway, what happened was um, the Greeks put up a small force. It wasn't a large force. It was only like maybe around 7,000. It's kind of a debate how big it was. Six, 7,000 is usually the amount they say it was. They brought these forces up uh, to try to block uh, the, the, the Persians at what is the Battle of Thermopylae, which is a three-day battle that took place sometime close to early August 480 BC. Like it says, vastly outnumbered. They're not sure how, how much outnumbered, but it, it may have been some ridiculous amount. Um, of course, the king that led this force uh, was King Leonidas of Sparta, uh, one of the most famous Spartan kings you've probably heard of. They've made a lot of movies about him, uh, including that movie I think you may have heard of called 300 uh, that's well known. She dies in, in the battle, you know, it's well, well known. Uh, and um, But uh, people act, you know, like there's just the Spartans fighting, but, you know, it's actually, yeah, 300 Spartans that are under him, and then you've got a bunch of other Greek forces, which the other two states that put up forces was Thebes and another state called Thespia, which was nearby. Thebes, I think both those were in Boeotia uh, that put up forces so those are the ones that mostly fought uh, in, the, in the actual battle. And uh, if you study about Thermopylae, uh, it was a very uh, tough battle for the Persians. A lot of it had to do with the Thermopylae Pass. Uh, today, if you go there now, it's kind of more wide, the pass, because of erosion uh, over time. But at the time, it was a very narrow pass. Very, very you know, few troops could actually get in at one point. So the Persians couldn't use their superior numbers to try and defeat the Greek force. They had probably could only put maybe an equal amount of forces to what they had on the Greek side. And so the first two days, you know, the Persians suffered really bad casualties. Uh, I forget the number exactly, but I think it depends on what the source. I know the video says maybe 10,000, but I think Herodotus maybe said it may have been double at least 20,000 at the most uh, that may have been killed uh, in the battle. <clears throat> so, so yeah, it was a three-day battle. Uh, yeah, there was a third day, of course, Thermopylae that happened. And what happened on the third day was the Persian forces eventually were able to outflank King Leonidas' forces uh, due to a Greek traitor uh, whose name is Ephialtes. Ephialtes was this Greek traitor basically switched sides uh, to the Persian side. He told the Persians about this, I think it was like a goat path or something that went around the mountain uh, where they could get around and outflank them. And so at that, Xerxes was able to surround him from both sides, from the left and right side of the pass. And so that led to basically forcing the, the Greek forces to fight to the death, uh, which they would, although only 1,500 fought to the death. Uh, most of the rest of the forces were evacuated. Spartans and some other forces fought together, uh, basically. Um, oh, and by the way, the name Ephialtes, I think the video will talk about it later, you'll watch later, but it does mean nightmare in Greek because what happened at Thermopylae became a nightmare uh, for the Greeks. And yeah, the uh, Persians, they won the battle. They won. That's one thing, you know, you forget about, you know, it seems like the Greeks won it, but they actually won the battle. The, the force under Leonidas was actually wiped out, including himself was, was killed in the battle. Uh, but they think it demoralized Xerxes' forces. It was kind of seen as this fire victory, you know, which is a type of victory where you won, but you feel like you lost because you suffered so many casualties uh, in the battle, uh, which is kind of what happened. Uh, so, uh, more or less, this maybe is kind of considered like a turning point, you know, in, in the whole Greco-Persian wars, because it looks like, you know, we got a chance that we can, you know, fight the Persians uh, at that point. Uh, from there, Xerxes then uh, came down the pass, of course, uh, into Boeotia. If you go back to the map I showed you, you can see the route uh, that Xerxes' forces came, came down through. So you got Boeotia here. Uh, stormed down here, of course, attacked Thebes and sacked that city. And then they also attacked Athens and sacked it too. 
uh, as well. So both those city states uh, were sacked uh, by Xerxes, including the uh, Athenian Acropolis was was burned. Uh, if you know about that. Uh, and of course, the Greeks, uh, what they did was they evacuated uh, to um, what is um, evacuated to an island you can see in that map that's called Salamis. Uh, you can see, kind of cover that up right there. I'll put it right here. But you can see a little uh, right, right close to Athens, to the west of Athens. You see that little island called Salamis. It's in the Saronic Gulf uh, is where it's at. Uh, and um, the Greeks, the Greeks, of course, will take on um, the Persian Navy. Uh, it's one of the things that happened. Uh, of course, it leads to the so-called Battle of Salamis, uh, which is a famous naval battle in Greek history. And the Greeks were heavily outnumbered. Uh, the Greek commander, of course, was uh, this general, of course, of a Athens named Themistocles. Themistocles is considered one of the great heroes of the Greco-Persian Wars, uh, probably one of the greatest, especially the second invasion. And he, what he does, he actually lures the Persian Navy into the Strait of Salamis to kind of, you know, do like a last stand, uh, kind of like what the Spartans and Greeks did at Thermopylae. And the Greek Navy was heavily outnumbered. According to Rodas, they had like 370 something ships, somewhere in that range. Uh, which were mostly triremes, which were triremes were a type of Greek warship uh, that's well known uh, that used like war powers and sails, like three banks of oars. Uh, and in the Persian side had about, well, there's varied numbers on that. Uh, so they think anywhere from 900 to like 1,200 is how many warships the Persians had. So it's kind of a debate about it. At least three, three to one, they were outnumbered, like in some of these other battles. And um, the narrow strait played a major role uh, in why uh, the Greeks won the battle. Uh, the Persians could not get enough of their naval force in there. So it became more of an equal battle, like you saw in the first two days at Thermopylae. And so uh, the Persians ended up suffering heavy casualties. They lost like something like two, 300 ships were actually lost in the battle uh, against the Greek Navy. Uh, and so uh, about Thermopylae was, excuse me, the Battle of uh, Salamis after Thermopylae was considered really to be the turning point really in the war because uh, the Greeks started winning pretty much after Salamis. And so uh, what happened uh, within like a few weeks after that, they think that Xerxes decided that he was going to have to evacuate because uh, he had lost some of his fleet at that point, which was helping to supply his force. Uh, and so between 480 and 479, Xerxes began to basically evacuate uh, from mainland Greece, although he left one of his generals behind, Mardonius, with about maybe, I don't know, there may have been 100,000 troops. I don't know if it was that many. It may have been. Uh, but he continued to try to see if they could conquer part of the Peloponnese. So they marched southward uh, towards where the um, Isthmus of Corinth is. Uh, but before they got there, uh, they were stopped by a, a kind of a com combination of force of like Sparta, Corinth, Athens, and some other city states that put up forces uh, at that point. I think they may have had 80,000 troops, and I, I think they seem to think that the Persian side had maybe 100,000 troops. And in August of 479, they fought one more major battle called the Battle of Plataea. Uh, and what happened was, Persian forces were actually wiped out. And Mardonius, you know, the general that was uh, under Xerxes, was actually killed in the battle. So that basically ended pretty much the bulk of the Persian wars, uh, at least the main ones in the Greek mainland. But they kept fighting, like the Greeks and the Persians kept fighting down to close to almost Herodotus' time, close to, six, to, close to 450 uh, B.C., uh, but like I said, they never really threatened to invade again. I think the Greeks thought they were going to come back with a third invasion, uh, but it never happened. Uh, and even after the wars ended, you know, you'll see later Alexander the Great will continue the wars, like a, you know, I guess a second series of wars. 
he'll be more successful than, of course, Alexander, and he'll actually invade and conquer the Persian Empire and basically take the whole thing uh, by about the 320s BC. But of course, I won't talk about that today. Uh, I'm going to, of course, you know, um, talk later. When I, I probably, maybe I'm thinking, hopefully, on Wednesday, we might get to talk about Alexander. We'll see how that goes if we have time. If not, we'll have to push it back if we don't get to that, that period. All right. So next, um, and I do have a few more slides here I have. If you want to look at them right here. Here's, of course, at the uh, site of, um, of course, Thermopylae today. Uh, they do have a statue of King Leon Leonidas that's there. Uh, and, of course, on the statue, there is a famous uh, epitaph or thing that he said, uh, they say, uh, according to Rodus, which was, come and get them, uh, which, of course, apparently at the beginning of the battle, uh, the Greeks were asked to put down their arms. Uh, and so the King Leonidas told them to come get them, <laughs> you know, come get our weapons, you know, that kind of thing. So... Uh, Themistocles also um, was a big hero uh, during and after the war. Uh, after the war, he became a kind of a political leader of Athens. He was archon for a while. And uh, so um, so he's pretty famous, uh, considered the, the big hero of Salamis. That's a typical Greek worship, you know, uh, Athenian worship. Uh, and um, I don't know if I'm showing you these, are I? Looks like I'm not for some reason. I don't have them up there <laughs> for some reason. I was, I was kind of showing you those. I don't know why I must have not had them on the screen. But, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, the famous statue of King Leonidas with the famous appetat on it, which is come and get them. Uh, Themistocles, uh, and then, of course, the famous Athenian warships. Uh, the Athenian warships um, were known for having battering rams on the front, which um, – that enabled the, of course, uh, Greek forces to sink, you know, multiple uh, Persian uh, naval vessels. You can see they used uh, three banks of oars, which is why they called it a trireme. So it means like three rower. It's kind of what it means uh, in Greek. So anyway, uh, let me go ahead and move on, of course, uh, to, uh, of course, talk about. I need to, of course, have some time I can get into and talk about what happened after the wars, after the Persian Wars, of course, came to an end. Uh, you know, the period afterwards, at least in the mid part of the 5th century, it's often called the Golden Age of Athens. I'll probably have a video later on that. Maybe I'll show you later in the week about that period. Uh, but the Age of Pericles uh, is, of course, one of the nicknames that they call that period. Uh, it's where the peak of the Greek city-states was, it was also the period of when Athens was really at its greatest power uh, overall. Some people call it the Golden Age of Athens because Athens was the one that was the, you know, yeah, the, uh, or Golden Age of Greece. I think they use that term uh, as well for it. Uh, and um, one thing that arose out of it was the empire that the Athenians formed. They took this military alliance I'm going to get into called the Delian League, they formed a confederation out of it of a bunch of Greek city-states, which may have had 150 or more in it. And they formed it initially to stop Persia because they were thinking that maybe the Persians might come back with a third invasion at that point. So that's why the Delian League was formed. And so basically the Athenians were able to take this uh, confederation uh, of this alliance and form kind of a trading league out of it, uh, which is what mostly it was, uh, where Athens used the trade throughout the Aegean, uh, where they export like olive oil and other things. Uh, and um, but yeah, it first started out as this, you know, opposition to Persia, you know, thinking that they were going to come back, uh, but Athens took it and made it into something for themselves, uh, and. Um, most of the over time, what you'll see is that most of the states that are in it are predominantly Ionian states that are throughout the Aegean. Like Athens was one of the main ones, but Eboa, which is the island of Eboa, which is close to Attica, uh, parts of northern uh, Greece, 
uh, throughout the Aegean and the Aegean Islands. You had all kinds of city-states uh, that were in it. Uh, there was one island called Delos, and that's where they actually had the headquarters of the actual Delian League. Uh, and they, had, they held meetings there. Uh, they also, states could send money uh, to the treasury, which was kept in the Temple of Apollo uh, that was on the island. Uh, and um, what happened over time, you study about, you know, the so-called uh, golden age of Athens and all that, Pericles came to power about 461. Pericles was this politician, statesman, and military leader uh, who kind of fought at the end of the Persian Wars. Uh, and he rose to power to control the state for about 30 years. Uh, he's considered one of their greatest rulers, especially in the 5th century BC. Uh, and so because of the, his dominance, they usually call that period the age of Pericles, which you can see 461 to about 429 uh, was about the time period that Pericles really controlled Athens uh, in the city-state, in its empire. Uh, and um, what are some things that he did, Pericles? Well, one of the first things that he did when he came into power was he moved the treasury. I told you the Delian League, which was on the Isle of Delos, well, he moved it to uh, Athens, and he put the treasury, you know where he put it, eventually he would put it in the Parthenon, uh, which acted kind of like a bank. You could actually put money in there. Um, and then, of course, with the money, they were able to take all that money, and they began to expand, you know, the Af Athenians' uh, power, like military power, like naval power, spent more like their armies. Uh, and then after that, he even began, you know, building a lot of various, uh, you know, construction projects uh, at Athens, including trying to reconstruct the whole uh, Acropolis, which had been burned by the Persians. So that's the thing he's mostly known for, Pericles, uh, is actually you know rebuilding uh, the Acropolis. I have a picture of Pericles, too, which is right here. Uh, some statues of them. There. I guess they're still around today. Uh, and, um, yeah, he's mostly famous for reconstructing the Acropolis, uh, which was done uh, more down, I think, near to the end of his uh, reign and power. And uh, the most famous thing he built is the Parthenon Temple, which I talked about before. Uh, they think it was completed close to about 429, 430 BC. And the uh, Parthenon Temple, like I said, was a temple that honored uh, the goddess Athena, but it was also built as a war memorial to honor all the, I guess, the soldiers that had died in the war. Um, and then I told you it could be used as a bank, which it was. So that's where the Delian treasury was actually kept, like the money for it. Uh, Pericles went out of his way to spend lavishly on the state. That was one thing that was very unique about the Athenians compared to other city-states, that they spent a lot of money on like culture, art, literature, uh, playwrights, like sponsoring playwrights, and various artists and sculptors and uh, things like that. So that was totally different, you know, foreign compared to, say, Sparta, that all they cared about was military uh, stuff and things like that. And like I said, uh, uh, Athens became more of an open society where anybody could come there. Like Herodotus wasn't even from Athens. He was from Western Turkey, as an example. Or Aristotle was from Macedonia. So he was able to come there and be a part of later Athenian culture. So like they were saying, they were more, more open, all that. Uh, now, Pericles uh, didn't stay in power forever. Uh, 429, somewhere around that time, uh, Pericles eventually died. I think he say, they say he may have died of, um, there was some kind of plague that ravished um, Greece at the time, which may have been the bubonic plague, which they're, they're not sure which plague it is. It's kind of a debate about it today. It may have been something else, like typhus or something. Kind of a debate about that. But what did happen right before he died, of course, was the Peloponnesian War broke out in 431 to 404 BC. Uh, these were a series of wars, really more like a civil war, uh, that was fought between the Greek city-states. Uh, and a lot of a lot of historians think that the Peloponnesian War truly really wasn't one war, it was like two or three wars. Uh, 
helped cause the decline of Greece. Uh, certainly to cause the decline of Athens, because after the war, Athens and its empire collapsed. It wasn't, of course, very powerful uh, anymore. And uh, yeah, there was a historian that wrote on this particular conflict, which his name was Thucydides. You may have heard of Thucydides. Thucydides was actually a, a Greek general that fought in the war. He later became an historian afterwards. He wrote a book about the war or a series of books. Uh, which became known as the history of the Peloponnesian War, which wasn't the original name, but that's what they usually call it, the history of the Peloponnesian War. And uh, part of why the war broke out was because of rivalries between these two alliances that formed against each other. It was, a, of course, the Athenian alliance called the Delian League versus the Peloponnesian League that was led by Sparta. So the whole conflict broke out because of competition between Athens and Sparta over, you know, who ought to have more power in Greece. And the Spartans were concerned that the Athenian Empire was just going to take over all of Greece and I guess form one state, which it could have, you know, over time. Oh, uh, yeah, here's the states that were in it. Of course, Athens was in it. Uh, a bunch of Ionian states were in it, including Eboa, and a bunch, I think Lesbos and a few others were in it uh, as well. And the Peloponnesian side, that was the problem. The you know, the Peloponnesian side had Sparta, Corinth, and Thebes, which were pretty powerful states. So you got to the south, you've got Corinth, you know, that's on the uh, Isthmus of Corinth. It blocks the, you know, the Athenians there. And to the north, you've got Thebes and Boeotia. So in a sense, basically, they were surrounded, uh, more or less the Athenian side, but the Athens was anyway. You can see a map here, too. Uh, looking at it, but yeah, Boeotia and the Peloponnesus or Peloponnese is all pretty much one side uh, versus the Athenians. You can even see the strategies they used, like the Spartans tried to mostly use, you know, land power, their armies to try and, you know, attack Attica. It got so bad, the Spartans had to build a fortification across the Isthmus of Corinth to block them uh, right here. And then the uh, Athenians tried to rely on naval power uh, to attack certain areas and move forces around. That proved to be their nemesis uh, in the war. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, in the year 415, uh, there was a, a disaster that happened, a naval disaster called the Syracuse Expedition, where um, the um, Athenian Navy tried to attack Syracuse, uh, which was a Greek city-state that's on Sicily, near Italy. They lost most of their fleet. Uh, and so after that, the Athenian naval power declined. And it led to the end of the war for them. They lost the war, uh, the Athenians. Thebes and Sparta eventually became the big powers after the war. That's one of the weird things about, about the war is that those two powers actually would come out on top. But believe it or not, Thebes would later defeat Sparta. I think a battle called the Battle of Leuctra, you may have heard of, which was later in the 4th century BC. And so Thebes for a while became the big power over the other city-states. But eventually what happens is with the decline of Athens and Sparta and all of that, Macedonia, which you see in the north there, is going to come down. They're going to eventually take control of the Aegean, of that area like in Greece. Uh, you'll see kings like King Philip II, who, of course, is going to do that first. He'll kind of take control of the region, uh, gets all his power. And then his son, even more, Alexander the Great, of course, will uh, go even further. Uh, and he'll expand eastward uh, into the Persian Empire and conquer that as well. Uh, so, so that's basically, you know, um, what happened with the, you know, the, those two conflicts, the 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 um, you know Greco-Persian Wars uh, and also the Peloponnesian War, all those wars in a sense kind of led to the decline of you know of you know of Greece, you know the city states because you know they're not really going to be like they are later. Of course, you'll see more kingdoms start kind of forming after that, and uh, I'll get more into the mass. I don't know if we'll, we'll, hopefully I don't know we'll see on Wednesday if I can get to the mass or not. Might not be able to. Uh, I need to also review real quick 
uh, some of the material, of course, we covered uh, from today. So I'll go ahead and cover that because I don't think I've covered, I'm trying to think what I covered last time. I think we reviewed some of this already, didn't we? Probably reviewed uh, from last time. I can't remember if I did or not, uh, but I thought I reviewed all that material there. Uh, so let me go to this slide here. So I think I did this one right here. Let me know if I did and I can go back. I thought I did this one right here, that slide. Um, so what were the Greco-Persian Wars, the Persian Wars? Uh, those were a series of wars uh, that were fought between uh, the Greek city-states, uh, of course. Let me put that on the screen, too, so you can see it. It's not up there. But they were fought basically between the um, Greek city-states uh, and what is the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, of course, Darius the Great, Xerxes the Great, of course, who we talk about, of course, later. Um, they happen over a 50-year period, mostly the early part of the 5th century when the whole classical period of Greece happens. Uh, what was the main cause of the wars breaking out? Uh, mostly due to the Persian Empire expanding westward uh, into western Turkey, where Ionia is. And yeah, the Ionian Revolt that broke out, uh, where the Athenians responded to that. And so you get this conflict breakout between both sides. Uh, of course, who is the historian who wrote on these wars? Of course, I told you Herodotus, uh, of course, was the main writer who uh, wrote about the wars. Uh, in his series of books called The Histories of Herodotus, or also called The History of the Persian Wars, it's called different names, who led the first invasion of Greece, or actually sent it, I guess would be the word to use, it sent the first invasion in 490 B.C., that was King Darius or Darius the Great. Uh, of course, the father of Xerxes the Great. He invaded uh, sometime August, September, uh, 490 BC. It led to the Battle of Marathon. Battle of Marathon, of course, was considered to be first major uh, battle in European history. Uh, it basically pitted between what was about 10,000 Greek hoplite soldiers. I told you from Athens and Plataea versus a Persian force that may have been at least 30,000 troops. And Marathon, of course, was, of course, a, a decisive victory uh, by the Greek side uh, where Darius's forces were totally routed. Uh, of course, according to Herodotus, involved the Dipides, who was this Greek runner and messenger uh, that supposedly told the Athenians that they had won the battle. But some people think it's a legend about the story that it might not have happened. So it's a famous story, but it's where the whole marathon sport came from later in modern times. Who led the second invasion of Greece? Or ADBs. That was Xerxes the Great, of course, the son of King Darius the Great. He led that one. Uh, what strategy did the Greeks develop against the Persians when they formed a military alliance? The Greeks decided to block the pass and straits in northern Greece. They blocked the Hermopoly Pass uh, north of Boeotia. They blocked also the Artemisium Strait that's near Thermopylae, a naval strait, water strait. And uh, so that helped to slow them down so they could bring up more reinforcements, but also give them time to evacuate their forces, the Greeks that are in the south. What occurred at Thermopylae, uh, which happened around August 480 BC, uh, a smaller force of Greeks, about 7,000, led by King Leonidas held off a Persian army that was huge. <laughs> they don't know how big it is, like maybe a quarter of a million. Maybe it was. They don't really know exactly. Uh, but uh, first two days, of course, was a stalemate. Uh, then, of course, the third day, uh, Xerxes was able to break through. So it was like a last stand battle, <laughs> which Thermopylae was, uh, where the Greeks fought to slow down you know, the Persian onslaught uh, into Greece. And it was a success later on because it helped to, you know, like I said, demoralize uh, the the Persian forces. And so Thermopylae is considered to be one of the turning point battles in the war because you've got some of those other ones that come later, which are very strategic. Uh, the, well, yeah, of course, we already talked about the Spartan king who led the force at Thermopylae. That was King Leonidas, of course, was the king. That was there. He was killed in the battle, of course. What naval battle changed the course of the war and eventually led to the Greeks winning? That, of course, 
was the uh, Battle of Salamis. That was the strategic battle, naval battle off the coast of Greece, the Strait of Salamis. And of course, a Greek Navy defeated the Persian Navy. And it led to the Persians under Xerxes evacuating. <clears throat> so yeah, they had the Battle of Plataea, but in a sense, I think the war was almost over at that point. They just mopped up is what happened after that. Uh, what was the Delian League that set up Athens by Athens and other states after the Persians were kicked out of Greece. Delia League was a um, Greek alliance of states uh, to prevent a, a third Persian invasion. Uh, and it had 150 or more states in it at one point. And Delos was where the original headquarters was and treasury. Uh, however, what happened was the Athenians took the League and they formed it into an empire, the Athenian Empire. It was a military trading empire, and it led to the Age of Pericles. What was the Age of Pericles? Uh, it was a 30-year period in the mid-5th century B.C. Where, where the Athenian Empire peaked in power under the politician and general Pericles. <clears throat> he was probably their greatest you know, leader overall, uh, probably better than Solon you know, and all those other ones. Uh, what was Pericles famous for as a leader of Athens? Uh, he uh, was famous for rebuilding the um, Acropolis, which included the Parthenon, the other temples that are built on it. I told you he was also a, a great patron of the arts, uh, culture, you know, poetry, playwrights, uh, you know, different artisans that built a lot of the stuff there. Pericles was also a kind of a Democrat in the fact that he pro-democrat in the fact he did expand democracy i forgot about that but he did expand democracy and gave more of the lower classes more political rights as well what more caused the downfall of the athenian empire that emerged at the beginning of the age of pericles that was the peloponnesian war and uh the peloponnesian war <clears throat> was um like i said a series of wars that were fought between the delian league of the Athenians and their mostly Ionian states versus the Dorian alliance of the Peloponnesian League. Uh, and of course, Athens lost the war because their navy, you know, eventually was crushed. And so they think that's pretty much what led to the decline of the whole Greek city states and the Greek age. Because I'll get to it later, of course. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it. I'll try to get to it in this week if we can, but uh, they have the, uh, you know, the Hellenistic age, which comes in, you know, which I'll talk about later. I don't know if I have time to cover all this stuff today. Uh, looks like extra stuff I had, I had in mind. Uh, but I had in mind to cover, you know, next the Olympic Games and Greek culture and all that. But I think I'm going to wait on that, I guess. I don't know if I have enough time for that today because that'll probably take a while, maybe 10, 15 minutes. So um, that's probably it for today. Uh, for this lecture. Uh, I'll have a part two this week later, uh, which I'll get into, uh, where I'll kind of talk about mostly Greek culture. If I do have any time left, I'll see what I can maybe talk about the Macedonians and all of that. I guess nobody has any comments for me. looks like it. Yeah, uh, But uh, like I said, um, remind you, don't before I go, don't forget, I've got some new assignments up. I, only one I got up right now which is on uh, ancient China's lectures. So start working on those. Well, you've got one on ancient India right now. Of course, you need to finish if you haven't done it yet. I will have a later, I'm going to wait till Wednesday, but I'm going to have an assignment later this week, a video assignment, of course, which is on a little short video clip. You can watch the beginning again if you want, uh, which is on the Battle of Thermopylae, Decisive Battles. Uh, so I'll have that later on Wednesday for you overall. So, I'll post this lecture up to my YouTube channel after uh, I finish streaming. Uh, so that's it for today. Hope you're having a good week uh, out there uh, overall. And I'll see you later this week with another lecture. So take care. Have a great morning.